Welcome, and thank you for joining us for this episode in the Fearless Minds Research Series, Stage Stories, Five Trials at the Queen's Theatre. I'm Dr. Tiffany Knight, a lecturer in drama here at Flinders University, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to today's discussion as we learn about Five Trials on the Queen's Stage, a performance project under development in Flinders. Now, to begin with, I'd like to acknowledge that we're hosting this discussion on the traditional lands of the Ghana people and that we pay our respect to their elders past, present and emerging. We also acknowledge and convey our deep appreciation to the elders of all the nations upon which Flinders operates. Now, this event is delivered as part of our Fearless Minds series. Throughout this series, you've met Flinders University's most engaging early to mid-career researchers as they bring you on their latest research from a diverse range of fields. Today, we are fortunate to be hearing from Dr. Christopher Harrell, a stage director and dramaturg who teaches acting and directing here at Flinders. Now, Chris, thanks for joining us today. Um, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about yourself and what is a dramaturg? <laughs> well, uh, that's a good question. There's some contest about the answer to that question. In fact, the first time I asked that question was just after I'd been first offered the job. Oh. Uh, and I got this email saying, will you be a dramaturg? I thought, oh, sure, but what is it? <laughs> uh, and so I went looking for the answer, and there are lots of different answers, but mm -hmm. the one that stayed with me was that a, the dramaturgy is the science of playmaking and that a dramaturg is someone who's skilled in the science of playmaking. Mm -hmm. uh, that stayed with me because I understood how it fitted with the playwright. If the playwright's the artist of the play, the dramaturgs, maybe the technician or something. Oh. Now, in, in the uh, European system, it's used in a very different way. The dramaturg is a researcher who works with the director, particularly on older works, to re-establish uh, how the play was intended to work in its original social and cultural context. Right. In the Australian and English system, we most often use it uh, on new works as a role in script development. So it's literally somebody helping the playwright uh, develop a new work. And so a playwright will come uh, to me uh, often with a very um, early first draft, a fragment, an idea, and it's my job to help them work through what they think might be emerging from that idea. Sometimes uh, the dramaturgy starts much later. On draft four, the play turns up on my desk and it's about what I might call the kind of finishing production dramaturgy. How do you really hone the structure, the characters, the flow, the energy of it to achieve, to more richly achieve its goal in terms of what it's trying to do uh, to an audience? Now, an immersive performance project's in development at the moment, and you're very much involved in that as a director this That's time. That's true. Is that right? Yeah. And it's featuring the history of Australia's oldest surviving theatre. So, on the mainland. That's right, yeah. yes. So, can you tell us a little <laughs> bit more about this building and its significance? Yeah, so this is the Queen's Theatre, and it's in Adelaide. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was built in, uh, well, well, it opened in 1841. It was built 1840 to 1841. And so, you know, we're talking in the very early years of, of settlement uh, and it was, it was amongst the largest buildings in the young colony at the mm -hmm. time. It was a massive entrepreneurial scheme. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this is what it looks like today. Uh, but that's about as close to looking like a theatre as it gets. When you go inside, it's really just uh, a warehouse space now. It was a car park for a lot of the 20th century. I didn't uh, know that. Yeah, and, and in the 19th, most of the 19th century, it was a horse auction. And that's why it says bazaar up in the pediment, hmm. because it was a horse bazaar. But in that brief moment after it was built, uh, when there was great um, optimism about how quickly the colony would grow, this is what it looked like when it was built. So a different facade. Um, Doing Shakespeare. Uh, well, the Shakespeare there actually refers to the pub attached. There was the Shakespeare Tavern where you got your drink and then you went in on into the theatre. Uh, but actually they did do Shakespeare and, uh, and this is one of the things that the piece we're uh, developing is, a, is in part about. Uh, when the, the theatre opened in 1841, a big gala opening, probably the biggest social event that had happened in the history of the colony so far, uh, they opened uh, with Othello. And one of the uh, questions that the, this piece that we're working on asks is, why did they choose Othello and what did they make of it? What did they think they were looking at when Who's, they... What do you mean by they? Like well, the, the settler or, audience, yeah. Uh, I mean, the thing that we know for sure is that 
is that, well, almost for sure, is that that audience did not include uh, First Nations people of, of the Adelaide Plain. Okay. Yeah, it was, and if you think about uh, where the, the, build, the, the theatre is on Playhouse Lane, which is uh, just off uh, Light Square, so you just run, Morford Street runs down to the, to the Torrens, and it was on the banks of the Torrens that the, that the Ghana people were encamped at this time. So just a few hundred metres away. And if you think about, it was a nighttime gala, and uh, you know, it would have been f uh, lit up like a Christmas tree with candles. What uh, the Ghana people must have made of this thing, and you know, goodness only knows what they would have made if they'd looked inside and seen um, a, an English actor manager playing Othello. Mm. Uh, so there are some really so we're getting straight away to to you know the theme of the piece. There are yes, it's a it's a, a piece of history, but the questions it raises. Uh, what are of interest to it and those are of interest to us and those questions get even more entangled because it only lasted as a theatre for two years right. and then it went bankrupt uh, and this is because the settlers left South Australia and in droves to go to the gold fields and there was an economic depression right. in the young colony and so the uh, entrepreneur who had built the theatre leased it to uh, the, the colonial government and they used it as the supreme courthouse so from and, a theatre to a courthouse. Yeah, yeah. In the, and, that all, and then after about eight years, <clears throat> the, the Supreme Courthouse of Victoria Square was built and it became a theatre again. Mm -hmm. And so within 10 years, it had been the kind of centre of legal practice and the centre of performance uh, in South Australia. Uh, and the, what went on under those two guises is the subject of the piece. So now you've told us a little bit about uh, some of the objectives of this research, but could you give us a little bit more detail about the objectives of the project, who's involved and what you hope to be learning and discovering through it? Sure. Look, I, I would, in essence, this is a project that is about restoration in all its uh, senses and truth telling mm -hmm. in all its senses. So one of the there's, there's been a, a research going on for a number of years and this is the research that actually has inspired this performance work into working out the truth of what went on in this building both when it was a theatre and when it was a courthouse uh, and to get to that truth we even had to work out the truth of what it looked like as I mentioned you know if you inside it looks like a warehouse today and there are no this lovely drawing, unfortunately, there's no interior equivalent uh, to this drawing. We have oh. no idea what it looked like. But like any archaeological process, you can reconstruct the the lost timber interior mm -hmm. from the vestiges that survive in the in the shell. And so that's the work that work has happened. It's been going on for almost ten years now. And along with that has been going on work into what kind of performing went on in the space, what kind of performing, was an audience of that era expecting, Do looking for. you mean what's, for. like the style of The style and the repertoire. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, so that's, uh, that's one layer of it. But then we get into another layer of, of finding out the truth when we get into this idea of when it becomes a supreme, the Supreme Courthouse. Mm. Um, and I'll, uh, and the, the title, the Five Trials title, refers to five court cases associated with the truth of this building. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all of them. It's a long story. Uh, but I'll give you, I'll talk about two of them to illustrate what I mean. Um, when the theatre opened in 1841, uh, it opened with Othello. Mm -hmm. uh, when, if you fast forward to 1849, uh, there's a, a particular se session of the Supreme Court in which a number of cases are being tried that really uh, exemplify what was going on in the colony by this time uh, with respect to the frontier wars. Right. So you know, Othello famously opens with a trial scene. Uh, before the, the, the Doge of Venice, uh, Othello is, is required to answer for his actions in marrying a white girl. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's one of our five trials. In 1849, a series of trials took place in which, by this time, you know, obviously there's, there's substantial violence between settler and First Nations communities. But what we're finding in the legal system 
in the response to that, those incidents is that the way in which white defendants are being treated by the legal system is very different to the way in which First Nations defendants are being treated, despite the fact that this building is part of a colony that was established with the written explicit intention of uh, delivering liberal, just governance to all residents of the area. And, you know, the, the colony was set up uh, with the uh, instruction that uh, First Nations people would be uh, treated with all the rights of British subjects. Yeah. But in practice, we find that's not what happened. And so examining the difference between, you know, it's, it's pretty, I mean, I won't go into too much of the detail, but it's, it's pretty uh, sad and, and shocking mm. uh, what went on there. You know, there, we know that there were uh, murders of, of uh, black men and women mm -hmm. uh, by, by settlers far out from Adelaide and, and uh, those settlers were one way or another allowed to either flee the colony or let off the hook. There was an attempt, they were put on trial, it mm. wasn't like uh, the wild, wild west. You know, there was an attempt to be seen to be doing equal justice, but the practice of it didn't work that way. Whereas um, uh, First Nations men who could not be interrogated properly because of the language barrier mm. uh, were found guilty and sentenced to death mm. in this building. Uh, and in fact, even on the stage of the theatre, the stage of the theatre was used as the dais of the Supreme Courthouse. The bowels of the theatre underneath the stage were used as the holding cell where these people were kept before. And the um, auditorium obviously was used as the, as the public gallery. Unbelievable. Oh, chilling. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a big topic, uh, but important to, uh, to tell those stories. Mm. And that's what I mean about... Uh, restoration through truth telling. Yes, we can uncover the truth of the building, but the the really challenging work and the exciting work is to uncover the truth of what went on there, honour that truth, mm -hmm. and uh, and bring some uh, form of restorative justice. So Jules is working as the dramaturg on this project, but she's yeah. also had a, a, a long history with bringing this project to life in a, in a number of other research capacities. Can you tell us a little bit about her research and the other people involved and how this project is building on that work? Yeah, that's the important thing to note is that there are a number of research projects emanating from Ostage, mm -hmm. uh, which is, uh, has its home at Flinders, uh, that relate to the Queen's Theatre, its history and its repertoire and its performance practice. Uh, and Jules has been working on a number of those different projects over a number of years. Mm. Um, the, the foundational research project for the Queen's was to recreate the lost interior. Uh, and there's a book uh, out now, Lost Theatres, uh, that investigates five such theatres and recreates through virtual reality uh, their interiors. And this is really exciting work in the case of the Queen's because we have no visual record of what it looked like inside. All we have is an empty shell. Mm. Uh, the VR model is now finished. Uh, it's finished at the moment in the form of an empty theatre and here it comes now. So you can sort of see from that exterior, that drawing we were looking at before. Mm -hmm. And now we've gone inside and this is you know, really exciting. This is Mary Moore's work. Mary Moore is a theatre designer mm -hmm. who's been working with Jules on this project for a number of years to, uh, through research into equivalent theatres in the United Kingdom and through archaeological research on the site in Adelaide mm -hmm. to reconstruct what it looked like. And that set that you're looking there, the reason there's a bed behind a curtain is that this is the final scene of Othello as it would have been presented in the early 19th century. That's the scene, that's the bed where Desdemona uh, loses her life to Othello. Uh -huh. Uh, so this is a VR set. That's People right. This is what we're looking at VR now. Goggles. Is a, That's right. This is a fly-through extracted from the VR model. Uh -huh. But, yes, you can stand inside the theatre um, uh, and you can stand on the stage, you can sit in the auditorium uh, with the, the VR headset on. And this work's not finished. Where I'm also involved in the research team uh, that develops the next stage of this model and the next stage is to fill the model. So eventually there won't just be a theatre, there'll be an audience, there'll be an actor on the stage. You'll be able to see what the audience looked like. You'll be able to hear what they were talking about before the performance started. And you'll be able to see and hear a 19th century actor take that stage as, all as avatars in VR.
this is uh, this gives you a taste of what of sort of my inspiration really because once I was involved in that uh, virtual reality model in development mm -hmm. then I I directed a play in the in the Queen's Theatre oh. as a warehouse space a long time ago straight after I first left Flinders as a student and so that question of what was it really like mm -hmm. has been in my mind for 25 years and I'm not the only one lots of theatre practitioners and members of the public too have been wondering and the VR model gives us the chance to answer that question. And so what we did just last month is take assets from the virtual reality model and transform them into uh, projection assets, 3D projection assets. And thanks to a partnership with Novatech, uh, took projectors into the space and created uh, this installation that you can see, reconstructing that auditorium in the surviving shell of the theatre. So and this is actually like the ghosts of the theatre playing right. on the walls of the theatre. That's right, right. that's right. And that is, and it's projected in the part of the shell where the auditorium was. That's exactly what it was like. So you've uh, mentioned one industry partnership already with Novatech. Mm -hmm. Is there the potential for other industry collaboration going forward with this project? Yeah, there's a lot of, uh, there's been a lot, as you can probably tell from the virtual reality model, there's been a lot of uh, partnership work already in the underlying research. Uh, Ortelia Interactive is the company that developed the virtual reality model from the designs by uh, Mary Moore and the drawings by Peter Kelly. Uh, the, we're now working with a, a further industry partner, Stantec, to create the acoustic part mm. of the model so that we can hear the audience. And eventually, that's a really exciting part of the project in its own right, eventually inside the model you'll be able to hear how the theatre sounded differently from different parts of the, of the theatre. Uh, but obviously if we're talking about creating a production, a live production, uh, then the opportunities for future partnerships really lie around the producing uh, element of, mm. of it. So we, what we'll do uh, in the next few months and over the next year here at Flinders is first create the performance text, then start to pilot what the performance might be like. Start to bring, and hopefully, Tiff, I can get you to come and work with me on this. That would be Tonight. excellent. <laughs> uh, we want to bring actors to the material. And then uh, once we've started to see what the performance might be like, and this is a very unconventional performance. It will, it will happen in uh, the Queen's Theatre. Uh, that has necessitated a further partnership, which we uh, is already active with uh, the company that operates the theatre today. Right. And it's through the partnership with them that we were able to be in there last month mm -hmm. in that photo I showed before. Um, and once we can, once we've drawn those elements together to get a sense of how the five different stories play out in different parts of the of the space, imagine. Um, a site-specific immersive performance in which an audience moves around mm -hmm. the different parts of the space to experience different stories. Some of them they might experience in VR, some of them through actors interacting with projection. Some of them might just be the actor in the space as it is today telling that story uh, or sharing an artefact from, from the archival record. Mm. Uh, then it comes the time to, to bring in another layer of industry partnership uh, to bring that performance to the largest possible South Australian public audience. I see. So you mentioned that I'm a performer and I actually did my practice-based research, uh, my PhD as a performer. You mm. did your PhD with your knowledge as, and expertise as a director. Mm. Could you tell us a little bit about how the Drama Centre is interested in supporting practice-based research in higher degrees um, going forward for people who might be interested in, in coming here? Absolutely, yeah. The, the, uh, the Drama Centre at Flinders is dedicated to the training of uh, performers and directors. Uh, but what's unique about that training is that it is research-led professional performance training. Uh, and so there is a really um, nourishing and, and alive position in that work for higher degree researchers. Uh, so. Uh, I imagine the, the offer I think that I, I, we can make to uh, people thinking about doing a practice research PhD in drama at Flinders is to come and do that PhD with us in the Drama Centre and to create the practical elements of the, of the PhD in collaboration with the honours students and the undergraduate students through the production work at undergraduate level. Well, this has been a fantastic discussion. Thank you so much, Chris. Thanks, Tim. Um, it's uh, wonderful to share this information with you and for you sharing your research journey with us. And we will, we will see you at the Queen's. 
Anon. Anon. <laughs> Thank you.